Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today, you might know best from his time composing the music for the DLC of Doom Eternal, but he has also composed for many other games, plus films and animation. It's been a long time coming for me to chat with David Levy. How you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for agreeing to do this. I think course, I calculated man. that it took a year for us to it make this happen. <laughs> almost almost to the day, actually. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> almost to the day. Because I think I contacted you shortly after the Mick interview aired. And yeah. yeah, and then for various reasons it couldn't happen. But we're here now, and I'm, I'm glad to be chatting to you. So Yeah, thanks. man, glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. So I think the thing I want to know most is where were you? Place, time, how did it happen when you got the the call from id Software or the email, actually? It was a call. It was straight from from uh, Chad Mossholder, the audio director. Nice. And um, I've known him for years. Um, and he um, straight up just asked me if I want to submit a demo for the DLC. And uh, I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, you're I bet. kidding? <laughs> Are you kidding? I'm like, um, I've said this many times before, but I'm, uh, I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll do it. There's no, I'm gonna get it, but I'll do it. Mm. I spent a few, spent a few weeks on it, and um, and sent it over, and um, I ended up getting it, which was even more anxiety-inducing than the thought of actually um, applying for it. Um, by writing a demo, you know. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of Mick's work and been listening to stuff for as long as I can remember. And just, just the thought of like uh, stepping in there and filling in their shoes are just, <laughs> it is anxiety inducing to say the least. Totally. So, how do you oh approach God, yeah. something like that? Like, um, do you copy, it, like, do you copy Mick's work in the demo? No, do you no, try no. to spin no, was, stuff? Like, no, no. We, um, you know, obviously Andrew Holscher was, was working on it as well. Mm. And, it was the guys were very strict, not strict, but they were um, pretty upfront about like the fact that they don't want us to copy Mick, kind of do our own thing, but obviously stay true to to what came before us. Otherwise, it's just you know out of out of respect the IP and and the the enormous success that 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 the music had. Um, so essentially, kind of work work off of that, mm. but do our own thing to it. Right. So what was the yeah. very first piece that you wrote? Once once everything um, was done and dusted in terms of the deal and it was all signed and everything, and the first track you worked on? First track was um, Atlantica. It was the Ambience uh, track for Atlantica. Was that to try and prepare you for the more heavy stuff? Um, no, I just, I kind of worked my way up in, in intensity, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because listen, the whole thing was... was um, it's a monumental task. We did not have a lot of time. It the, the production happened during COVID, and um, we got on board uh, at the very end of, of 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 the production cycle for the DLC. Uh, Andrew and I. So time was very limited, and uh, the deadlines were, were pretty pretty aggressive. So um, the way I kind of broke it down is just for for people who are not familiar with the way the music works for this game you have the three different levels of of intensity um that correlates to um to the gameplay so you have the ambient music when you walk around and pick shit up and then there's um just light combat and heavy combat and um each of those intensity levels usually have their own track and each, and each of those tracks are about 5 minutes or so and um the way we had to write the music is in like little segments, like it's it's supposed to be modular. So five minutes of ambient music could consist of, I don't know, it depends, but let's just say like five minutes consists of like, say like um, five pieces and each piece is about a minute. And the way the game in the game engine handles it, it would go ahead and, and it would it would shuffle everything around when you play. So when you die and start again, it, you'll never hear the piece in the same order ever. Mm. So it's kind of challenging to write music like that because you have to write the piece like, you know, A, B, C, D, E, and or one through five, and three needs to work before one, and one needs to work after four, and, and vice versa. It all needs to, like, make sense, which is, like, that was kind of a mind fuck. So um, were you, did you have, like, an Excel spreadsheet or something to keep track of what, what version <laughs> no, you No, I just... 
No, no. It was just kind of like those are there's just kind of use my ears on it, you know, like some pieces didn't work and some did. So I, I kind of figured it out as it was going as it was in, in, um, so, so we had the ambient music. So I start with that because in a way, quote unquote, it was the simplest, you know? Um, and once I figured out a system to do that with, you know, the modular writing and all that, I continued to the light combat and then the heavy combat. And, and the trick for me was to kind of just break everything down to pieces um, cause you go in thinking about, holy shit, like I have to write music for this massive game and, and, you know, the whole mix thing in, in, in the back of my head, like how fucking awesome everything he's done is. And, um, it was, it was a lot, it was a lot to handle. So I, I, I feel like it's just like anything else. Like you just kind of have to like look at this, this mountain, this wall and start like kind of picking at it and, and, and take it like, you know, take w one step at a time. Yeah. And it's essentially what I did, you know, from from writing like a certain amount of music for just for, for for a map, you know, then you start breaking it down for the intensity level and then the segment or whatever the modular piece and then kind of build up from that. So that's how I um that's how I remain sane <laughs> through through the process. Did you try to apply any of mix mixing philosophies? Um all? Not, I mean, not really. I don't know what the guy is doing exactly. He's he's, he's got a fucking very brilliant, unique sound. He does, yeah, yeah he yeah. does, he does. Um, yeah, I. <laughs> this is way before years before I, um, the whole Doom thing came up for me. Like I would sit here and listen to his mixes and just kind of like I, I would just be baffled how how he's doing it, how he's getting all that low end in there, and how everything is so fucking clean and so punchy. And, yeah. Um, he, he developed an amazing sound for himself. Um, so no, I, I can't say that I used his techniques because I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> um, but you know, I did what I could with, with what I had in the time that I had. And, um, yeah. Uh-huh. But I suppose as a musician though, you're constantly getting better in terms of your mixing and how you yeah. compose. And I suppose, I mean, cause I've seen you have all these different like modulators and plugins and stuff and it can be yeah. never ending right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you toss it, out it, the old stuff and keep the new stuff or um, you just end up with this massive horde of uh well plugins well not i mean it's like yeah just hardware units and stuff i um i i don't really change it up that much but for certain projects if i need certain sounds and um if there's a budget um, then I will go and and purchase whatever I need to achieve that sound. Mm. So um, and oh uh, yeah, go on. Yeah and yeah. no no so so for the most part no I I, I don't really get rid of things very often. <laughs> <laughs> so you just you just keep them for when you might need uh, them again. Yeah yeah you never know. <laughs> yeah. So were there things specifically that you bought when working on? Doom? Um. Or did you already have stuff floating around? I I already have stuff floating around. But I invested in, in even more um, uh, tube-based gear because that kind of seems to get that super aggressive, gnarly, you know, over-the-top, distorted, mangled sound. Uh, you can't really achieve with plugins. I mean, you can, but it kind of sound to me sounds kind of flat for the most part, and it's missing that harmonic uh, distortion that you can get from transformers and tubes and whatnot. Yeah. So I, I kind of went. Um, a little more aggressive on, on that end. So all those instruments in the back there, you can play yeah. very well, I assume? Um, I mean, define very well. <laughs> no, I, I'm a drummer and I'm, more than anything, that's like my main instrument, right? Right. I grew I grew up playing the drums. Um, I picked, them, picked up the drums when I was like 13 or 14 years old. It's like, that's my main instrument. And I would say 90% of the... Um, of the music for um for doom for the ancient gods was written on the drum set first oh um, really yeah i would just because i just think rhythmically rhythmically i guess um so everything kind of works around that for me um i would just write the rhythm and then build upon that so usually after you've you've laid the foundation with the drums yeah. Like, what's usually the next instrument Guitars. that you bring in? 
guitars right away guitars yeah yeah and it's kind of like when i write the parts on the drums like the rhythms I, i'm already kind of thinking forward and like a couple steps ahead for the guitars what the guitars are going to be doing and i'm almost like adjusting the parts on the drums kind of trying to envision what the guitars are going to do on top of that right if that makes sense yeah so yeah it, go, it goes around that so a lot of times the guitars just kind of mimic the rhythm of the, of the drums of, of the kick drum or whatnot um that's kind of how i worked on on most of the stuff for doom yeah for whatever reason that just came out most most natural way that's cool because it's a lot of it is not very melodic based you know what i mean um because doom is all about it's all about the rhythm right yeah um, it's all it is the, all about it's, the all about it's all about the pulse in in um yeah so it kind of made sense to go off the drums for me mm. as a drummer yeah so there was a couple of tracks i specifically wanted to ask you about the the trial of malagog yeah so how did how did that come about how far within the development cycle was it um it was i i just had like a schedule of like x amount of weeks and um you know i knew that all the music had to be delivered by a certain date and i i was responsible of like setting things up for myself however i wanted in terms of of um of deadlines you know hmm. um so and that's usually like that with most big projects i mean there are milestones and such but um within those milestones i can arrange things however i want um so it was um Melagog was just it was i believe i worked on it right after i finished atlantica it very next about, piece yeah, yeah, very next one. And um, I forget what else I did on there. There was that the ending credit scene, like the ending. You did the, the credits, credit Amora stuff as well. The the what? The more is it? The more, yeah, but that's like that's like the second DLC. Oh yes, yes, we had like, yeah. Yeah, we had like a tiny break um in between, and um, but yeah, on that um, I did all the cutscenes, and then. Uh, like the um, the menu music, not the menu. I'm sorry. Like just the little intro music in Atlantica and uh, Melagog. I don't think I'm forgetting anything, but yeah. So it's just kind of like just attacking one thing at a time. I believe uh, the order was, if I'm not mistaken, it was Atlantica and then it was Melagog. Then it was um, like the little intro piece when um, 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 like the the game come up, like the logo when it comes up, and then I did all the cinematics, and that was it for that DLC. Andrew did uh, two two levels. Right. Was there a bit of a yeah. friendly rivalry between you and Andrew, in terms of? I don't of, think so. In terms no. of well, in terms of creating. Maybe the music. it was like no, I don't. I don't think so. I never felt that way. He's such a good guy. Um, he's super nice, and um, we kind of did our own thing, but at the same time, we would we would bounce ideas off each, off of each other whenever we could. It didn't happen too often because it was very like it was a very aggressive deadline. We just had to keep going as fast as we could. But I remember, like, when we finished everything, we kind of sat down in, um, uh, remotely. Obviously, he's in Dallas and I'm in Austin. And we just started, like, exchanging pretty much all the files and listened to it and just kind of talked about it and stuff. Um, and that was, for whatever reason, at the end of that cycle, of after I submitted all the music, like, I was even more anxious than I was before I started the music, before I started writing the music. Because to me, I'm like, I was... I was mortified. I'm like, okay, it's written. I, I, I don't know if it's good enough. You know, I feel like we need more time. Like, what are people going to say? And that's a complete panic mode. And um, I think Andrew felt a little bit of that as well. Well, the thing um, is, like, I, I think a lot of people fully don't recognize your background because you've actually done a lot of stuff, right? Prior yeah. to Doom. I mean, you've been in the industry for ages. Like, yeah. and not just video games, but films. And, like, you've done animation, like... um. Gen I've done a lot of animation, yeah. Yeah. Um, but Doom was my first like triple A like project. Yeah. Of that of that magnitude, you know. Um, but up to that, like the the biggest thing I worked on was uh, the show Genlock by Rooster Teeth, and that was fucking massive. That was a big ass show, and it's on HBO now. And um, yeah, I finished that, and I think it was maybe less than a year. And I got the call from Chad. I think he heard some of my stuff on it. And, um, yeah, and he called me up and asked for me to submit a demo. But, um, <laughs> it's yeah. It's so awesome. Um, yeah, but it's it's very different. You know, working on games and film and shows, It's you're writing music, but 
it's it's all it in a way it's it's very different. Like with film, what I like about film is the fact that you got your scene, and once you figure out the emotion that you're gonna work off of, and and um, the instrumentation, the tonality, whatever it is, you start doing it. You start writing the piece to the picture, right? It's right there in front of you, and if it sucks, if it doesn't work, you know it right away, right? Like you see it. It's just like like the music doesn't it doesn't stick. It doesn't stick to the picture, and you change. So um, you change whatever it is that then needs to be changed. Uh, if it's an instrument, if it's a, the melody, the chord progression, and whatnot. But uh, the game is a little different. Like um, there was an instance where um, I wrote a track. I think it was for Mora, and it sounded it sounded good. I thought, and then I'm like, you know, let me see what it actually feels like with, with gameplay. And I had Chad send me a short clip of just like some gameplay and it sounded like shit. Like it was too fast. It was too busy. You know, it's kind of like a sensory overload. So um, so usually what, what I did from that point on is I, I always had like clips to work with. And when I wrote something that was confident enough with, I put it against the picture of the gameplay and I saw how, how it felt and how it worked. Um, but you know, there's another instance with Amora where um, I did the same thing as Atlantica. I started with um, just um, ambient stuff, and then the um, light combat, and then heavy combat, and everything sounded good. But it got more and more aggressive, like the the as it went as as, as it went along, right? Like the um, the heavy combat was so aggressive that it made the light combat feel out of place. Like, it's just, like, when you have to go back and forth in the game, and that's something I didn't really anticipate until all three levels were kind of put together. You know, you put in the game, and, and it shifts, you know, from the heavy stuff to the slow stuff, like, to the, to the ambient stuff. And it just, it was like getting kicked in the balls. As soon as you get out of the heavy stuff, it just, it drops. And it was, it was like, it was, it was too ambient. And um, I had to essentially... I talked to Hugo and chat about it and concluded that the ambient music needed to be rewritten. So I had to rewrite the entire thing because it just wasn't, it wasn't working. So even though it felt good in the gameplay, right? Because I've been testing it. Um, well, I was writing it, I'm like, that, that feels good. You're walking around, you're picking up stuff. It feels awesome. But as soon as it comes out of the heavy stuff, it doesn't feel awesome at all. It feels too slow. So it's, it's a pretty like multi-layered uh layer thing there so would you do a lot games. of overnighters like um 24 hours i try not to nights? i try not to man no i try not to it's just it does like nothing good comes out of it like i'll hit the deadline if you know if it comes down to it yeah i'll do it but i really try to like organize my time in a way that i i'm i don't find myself with my back against the wall because i've i've gone through that during gen lock we can talk about that in a little bit um and just get burnt out and then from that point on, like, unless it's the very, very end of the project, and then you know you're, you're done for a little bit, you can actually sleep and rest, and it's, it's counterintuitive. Because, you know, um, I'm going to stay up all night, and then the next day I'm just going to be fucking out of it. And then it's going to take me forever to catch up, and then whatever my output that day is going to be very, very low because I stayed up all night. So for me, it's all about kind of organizing things and making sure that... Um, that I'm hitting my 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 own deadlines. Mm. You know, is it true yeah. that your mother-in-law thought that you were a satanist because of your work? Uh, on I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised because, <laughs> <laughs> dude, I, <laughs> I was fucking and and like the neighbors too. Look, I found a pool in the neighborhood that was being built, and I got um some stems out like the more stuff um and reamped it in the pool. And it was blasting it. I got my big ass speakers in there, and I did it like I, I It wasn't too late at night. It was like nine o'clock, right? And man, I I don't know how people didn't call the cops on me because that shit sounded fucked. <laughs> like that that metal choir dude, and it was resonating the entire fucking neighborhood. Um, but yeah, um, I'm sure people got a little freaked out, but uh, it was worth it. <laughs> So but yeah, my mother-in-law, you know, I was working with the, with, the, um, with the metal choir for a while and I was, you know, I got to, um, I had access to all the, um, 
um, all the raw material that, that Mick and, and, uh, and, and Chad recorded. So um, I got in and I started like editing it and, and kind of creating new, new things out of it and um, manipulating it and processing and whatnot and, and incorporated it heavily into the more um, um, soundtrack. Because it was like the last battle, and it needed to be fucking epic. It needed to be massive, and I couldn't think of a better way to, to do that, you know, mm-hmm. than to use that use that choir. So um, I was editing that shit for weeks, and it's just like, it's <laughs> it's like disturbing sounding, I'm sure, from the side, you know? Um, so, yeah, probably thought I was, sat- I was a Satanist. <laughs> was the choir the only thing you got access to? Did you get access to anything else, um, or was it yeah. just a choir? No, that was it. And yeah. it would have been a massive library of choir samples. Is it what? What is it? It would have been a massive library of choir samples. Um, it was like one really long take or something. Ah, oh. I forget. Yeah, it's like about two hours or something. There's like different little segments in there that he recorded and had them perform different things. So yeah, he did a brilliant job of that. Like he got really good things out of those guys. So you basically had a two-hour-long take, and then you just kind Something of had like to go that. through it. Essentially, and cut, essentially cut it yeah, went through into it small and little cut what, clips. Exactly, whatever was relevant. Wow. And then kind of change, like created rhythms out of that, and built songs around it. You know. Wow. Yeah, that was that was fun. So something I'm curious about is is your cat because your cat has become <laughs> yeah. as important as you are. <laughs> was it always the intention, like with your videos? You know how you got the, the cat. Well, always... it kind of it it kind of started like um, I don't know how it happened, but it just happened, and I just went with it because it was it was too funny to me. <laughs> yeah, um, I I incorporate it into everything now. <laughs> but was it an accident how it came to be? Like, did the cat just? end up doing something funny and you just edit it in one um, day as a laugh? Um, I don't even know how it started, honestly. <laughs> I feel like it was a while ago. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember the point when it started. I just know that like it was posted somewhere, maybe on YouTube or something, and then um, it kind of blew up and I found it really funny and I just kind of went with it. Because <laughs> now you're synonymous with the cat. It's yeah. like your thing. Yeah. So... Yeah, and everything you post, you have to have the cat now. It, someone, someone like commented, like, because it was associated with, Atlant- with Atlantica, and um, someone on YouTube commented that um, this is the Atlanta cat. I'm like, that's it. That's his name. For- his name is Wheezy, <laughs> <laughs> right? And uh, but officially, this is this is his name now on the internet. <laughs> Atlanta yeah. cat. That's Atlanta awesome. Atlanta cat. Are you gonna get yeah. like a what is it like a little um a little tag? I think I should. <laughs> <laughs> and, hey, and if the cat ever goes missing, you would know how to find it straight That's away. Right. <laughs> <laughs> em- embrace that shit, man. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. So you're it's working funny. on um project simulation right now. I saw your little. I. Yeah, your, I your, was your cool little I, string with the yeah with, yeah was yeah, it the cello? yeah yeah. It was a cello, yeah. yeah. It was a it was a very cool project. Um, I, I'm taking a little break from it now because I start working on um, an animated film that I can't really say anything about, of course, unfortunately, yeah. due to NDAs and shit. But um, I'm working on that now, and Project Simulation is um, is waiting for me. <laughs> as soon as I'm done with this with this film, I'm gonna go back and work on that. Um, it's kind of like um, I can talk about that. Um, it's a um, it's kind of like a futuristic type um, uh, first person shooter, like alien robotic invasion type thing. Um, it's super cool, super dark, right up my alley. Um, yeah, I start writing some music for it, but there's still a lot that needs to 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 get done on it. Mm. So yeah, I'm look, looking forward to going back and, and doing some aggressive aggressive stuff on that. Do you manage so? Do you manage one project at a time, or are you? I try on multiple, to. Multiple no, I try to. Time. I try to. I try to. I try not to work on multiple projects at a time. Uh, it's too stressful, and I, I can't focus on. It's, I just want to give the project everything I got. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I just prefer to do one one at a time. And uh, and simulation is something that's going to take 
it's it's a game you know game cycles are they take many years to complete um um so there, there's definitely time on that that's why i talked to the developer and, and i knew that 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 film was coming up um and i have no problem with it like me just kind of stopping for a few months and working on a film so mm. yeah I'm, I, that's what I try to do. I was at a point in my career like many years ago and I was just like, I was juggling too many projects and it's just too stressful. I just, I don't like it. Well, usually yeah. I hear from a lot of the various game composers I've spoken to and even game developers as they get older, the desire to do that becomes lesser and lesser. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 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 And you have more responsibilities as well. And you don't have the energy, exactly. I suppose, either. That that's what it is too. That's what it is. Because, um, yeah, I guess it's an energy thing as well. But um, I I do like to just kind of throw myself into a project and just kind of you know like just l live it for for what, whatever amount of time that I'm working on. Just breathe it, eat it, whatever. It's always in the back of my head and always thinking about parts and melodies and whatnot. So if I can schedule stuff like that then, then then I do it. So what does a day look like for you in terms of its structure? So do you get up in the morning, have breakfast, boom, hit studio and then you're just yeah. there yeah, no, and you I, never I, leave it? I I start really early. Um I start at like seven thirty in the morning. Wow. Yeah. And then yeah, do you leave I, it just to take a shit or something and then come back and then that's it? Um I mean, it depends. I usually, I, I'll, I'll work as much as I can, essentially, break for lunch and get back in there and, and keep, keep going. <laughs> right. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very kind of strict with myself with that stuff. Like when I'm working, I'm working and, um, yeah, I take that shit I take that shit very seriously. Mm. So there's usually no, no breaks for no games, no nothing, no nonsense. What you about, know? how do you deal with air fatigue though? Cause you know if you're ear fatigue, if you're, ear if fatigue, you're listening to music for so long, like it, this is true. Um, it's I'm glad you asked that. I, I've never I've never been asked that before. Usually people ask about like um, being burnt out or, or not having any uh, having like writer's block, but ear fatigue happens often. Like especially with like with like uh, it happened a lot with Doom because this is very distorted stuff, mm. very loud, very like harsh and abrasive sounding, and it kind of tears through your ears. Um, and now, like the problem is, like a lot of times, I don't realize that I'm I'm having ear fatigue. I'm not I'm not realizing that it's I'm I'm making bad judgment calls right now. Um, so um, I try to kind of break like every couple hours, even for like 15 minutes. You know, just walk around for a little bit and come back, and then I'm here like, and I'm gonna hear a lot of things that I haven't before. Um, and when I mix though, like, I feel like when it comes down to mixing, actual mixing at the very end, like I, I don't mix very loud cause I do most of the production and I kind of mix at, as I go. Um, when I'm writing the parts, I'm, I'm usually going to get the sounds to be like 95% there. So at the end, it's just a matter of balancing things. So the ear fatigue kind of happens more on the production side and not really in the mix side, which is, which is better. Because mixing while you're fatigued is, is a fucking disaster. You have to keep like, you know, you're not hearing things right and you're going to go back and, and remix things like dozens of times until you get it right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's actually so, a, a valid point. Uh, because, yeah, it can be a disaster during the yeah. mixing phase. So really, really, uh, I, I try to take breaks. I Even like, I, I'll, I'll just look at the time in, in about two hours into whatever it is I'm doing, I'm going to stop for 15 minutes, even if I don't feel like it, just for just for, just for for a bit, you know? Sometimes when I come back, I'm, I'm going to hear something that I haven't heard before at all. I'm like, oh, shit, that's way too fucking bright. Or it's going to sound fine. So, <laughs> yeah. But are you ever worried, though, that you'll lose the momentum? Because you know how sometimes you can get into a bit of a zone. Yeah. yeah. And, and you don't um, want to stop I'm, I'm, that. No, I, if I'm in the zone, I'm not going to stop, you know? But, um, yeah, no, that's, this is true. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to stop from in the zone, but yeah, I go in and out of the zone a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how much time would you spend on mixing? Like one song or one track? I on mixing say. a song? I, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't, I don't think I mix that much because, uh, and are you referring to like mixing in the traditional sense when, when you have 
all the elements at the end after the song's been written and you start mixing it? Is that what you mean? I suppose so, but then in video games, like you're not mastering to a CD as such, so it doesn't it doesn't require the traditional format per se, right? right? Because you, yeah, that's kind of what you're I'm getting mixing, at. You're mixing for in game use, so you're actually mixing it, so it works in conjunction, like with the sound effects as well. Yeah. So it's yeah. not uh, overpowering yeah, that, the sound that, effects yeah, or that, vice that's versa. Up, that's not really up to me. That's up to um, that's up to the audio directors. Usually, they're in charge of, of of implementing tools or whatever it is that they're doing in their in the engine, and wise and um, they um, they handle the, all the volume automations and stuff. Right. So I'm just yeah, I'm just giving them a track. <laughs> so you you don't have any like protection of it like this is my baby i want to have some no dude input. that that and... shit that shit had to go out the fucking window as soon as i start working professionally like you cannot have an ego you cannot be attached to your stuff that is just bad um because you're you're you you cannot again you can't have an ego if you're doing this professionally because you got to remember like you know so many directors and 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 producers or you know you work with them and there's so many instances where they just don't like a cue that you wrote which is unfortunate, but you can't be too attached to it. And you got to remember, you're here to like, um, or you're there to, to help them fulfill their their vision of the project. You know, so you are hired to do a job, right? You're not doing this for fun. This is not. I don't know. That's kind of how I look at it. Um, just kind of try to be super professional about it, and and make sure that the directors and producers and whatever the fuck that like, that they are happy cuz then they it's it's they're they're fucking paying they're 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 writing the check you know it's their project they got you on board it's not the other way around so um i mean i've i've heard like bad stories from from directors that were working with like prima donnas essentially you know they couldn't they can't give any bad any bad feedback about the music the composers would just freak the fuck out um, and that's, I don't know, to me, that's just childish. So you can't, I'm not attached to it. They can do whatever they want. And oftentimes with like with directors, I, I, um, for movies and shows, like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll write the cues or the episode or whatnot, and I'll have the director come over here or, or go over to the studio, the production uh, facility, and we'll sit and watch everything. You'll give me notes and go in and fix it. And that's it. Now, there's some instances when I feel like they're not right, and I'll tell them, I'll, I'll try to persuade them, but if they're putting a foot down, then it, it's fine. It's, it is what it is, you know? Mm. But have you so, always been able to have that ability, or is it something you learned when you went professional with this stuff? Um, I think I, I learned it at some point. Um, I don't know when. I can't really pinpoint it, but I think it was something along the lines of like, having like a bad experience with a director that and and you know what's important to remember is that like a good director with like a good ear is going to put all the faith in you let you do your thing and um they like if they're good with music it makes your life as a as a composer a lot easier um it's easier to communicate with them and they can foresee where things are going um but like i learned in the beginning that you know, I think it was a, it was like a bad. I was working on a game, and the guy was just he just wasn't great with music. He didn't know what he wanted, so it was a lot of like for me. Like the biggest lesson I learned in the beginning is like, is like talking to the directors and and game developers, and like really kind of like setting expectations and understanding what they want. I feel like the most important part when you start a project is sitting with the guy that you're gonna be working for and understanding what they want. And some some directors are not good. They don't have a musical ear and whatnot. They don't know what it is. I mean, they know what they want, but they don't know how to explain it. And it's your job to extract it from them. And for me, like a lot of times, I'm like, I'm the first thing I'm going to ask is just give me references. What do you like? And then they'll send me songs. And if the songs don't make sense, then I'll know. Okay, this I'm going to have to dig deeper here with this guy. And then it usually gets to a point where like, oh, I just like the drums in this track. I'm like, okay, so it's kind of my job to piece it all together you know and and if you do i think if you do a good job on 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 that first step on the first stage then you're not going to find yourself in a point where you're writing something like the cue is done and you're completely off that hasn't happened to me 
in as long as I can remember because I kind of do the groundwork first and I try to do a good job of just, you know, gathering all the pieces and all the clues from the directors and whatnot and um, going in pretty confidently to, to do my job. And throughout the process as well, I'm, I'm always, if, if I have questions, always reach out and, and uh, make sure that our needs and wants and whatnot are, are aligned. Right, um, but in the so, case, you know, if you do that, if if you, if you do that, you don't really get to a point when your shit gets completely butchered. Yeah, but in the case of Doom, right, they obviously told you, clean slate, don't copy Mick, do yeah. your own thing. Do your own thing. Remember what was done before you. Yeah. Don't stray too far from it, but do not copy. You don't need to copy Mick. Do not copy Mick. No one wants to copy Mick. You can't copy anyone. You know, this is Mick. That's his sound. Even well, if I wanted to copy it, even if I knew exactly what he was doing, it still wouldn't sound the same. I don't write music the way he does. I don't think the way he does. I don't. Oh you know, yeah, totally, it's totally. It's, it's personality. And it's actually, it's, I actually think it would be it, harder so. to copy someone's work than doing your original work anyway. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And no one wants to hear like like someone else's like clone. <laughs> like to me, that's just that feels cheap. You don't want to do that. Like as a player, especially, I don't want to hear something that's been copied. You know, I know it's not the original guy. I don't want to hear this. Just give me, give me something new. But also, you know, remember what, <laughs> remember what people liked. <laughs> so, so I suppose yeah. you'd be down to do another Doom if if the opportunity arises. Yeah, of course. It more, yeah. than, it more than likely will. No, it was it was such a fun game to work on. Like like up to that point, I was doing a lot of just kind of like hybrid orchestral stuff. But with Doom, it was so fucking aggressive, like just running stuff through all this gear and tubes and throwing everything you got on it at it, and it's still not enough. It was just, it's like a sonic fucking like uh, Wonderland. Um, it really is. You can do so much. There's so many, so many things you can do. I've never experienced anything like it. Uh, but also, it's a, it's a very niche sound. So, you know, all, all this gear I have and the way I was pushing it, like. 90% of it is not really applicable to other projects. Can't. Like all these pedals I have here, I try them. I try them all the time and it's just, I can't. They just fucking, they destroy everything that goes through them. <laughs> you know, I'm like, damn it, I really want to use them and I can't. <laughs> so was there a bit of a cloud nine while working on Doom and then after it's over, it's kind of like no, a down No, was never cloud nine. This no? Still, no? Never cloud no, nine? I don't think so, no. I was too stressed out. <laughs> I'm like that with every project I work on now. Like I don't really, I feel like I don't really enjoy it. I'm always so stressed out, like making sure that I'm doing the best job that I can. And I'm like super like critical of everything that I do to the point where sometimes it's like almost like self-sabotaging. And I, I had to learn over the years to kind of shut that, that, that voice in my head down. Um, especially like the beginning beginning of of any project like sitting and just writing the first track and going through the motions like there's that voice in the back of my head it's like you don't know what the fuck you're doing like what is this you know it's garbage it's not coming out imposter and syndrome i guess yeah yeah and just had to just fucking get over that shit um so i don't really again i it's it's always that kind of voices saying uh, you, know, you gotta do better you gotta do better and i, I don't really get to actually um I guess I don't get to enjoy it as much as I should, but I do remember like many nights like sitting here working on Doom, and I'm contradicting myself completely, and just, just kind of like exploring like, sonic like uh, possibilities with things and designing sounds. I'm like, this is awesome, this is great, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's like it's very uh, few moments where I, I completely got lost in it. But I I did really really appreciate the the freedom that that I was given. And, and all the possibilities that 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 um that was able to uh, explore with this game. Mm. You mean like you mentioned obviously putting the weight of expectations on yourself. I've I've yeah. noticed that with a lot of composers that I've spoken to that it that's quite common. I think that's just something that's common in creative people. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't I, feel too bad about it. Next time you feel like that, just remember. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe I should. Yeah. I don't get to talk to too many people about this kind of stuff, so I don't know if I'm just crazy or all crazy or this is normal. I, don't I know. think all creative <laughs> people are crazy. I think it's just the nature of the beast. <laughs> yeah, it comes with the territory. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So yeah. obviously, I need to ask you about Genlock because obviously, I think that's the stepping stone that 
got you to Doom, yeah. right? So how did that actually even come about? Well, um, okay, so with Genlock, I was already working with Rooster Teeth, and I've been working with them for a good five years or so. Mm. Um, I was brought on during Red vs. Blue Season 13. They needed, um, there was already a composer. He's been working on the show for 13 years already at that point. And they needed something that is, they need more of like, more of like an epic orchestral stuff type sound for that season. And the producer kind of searched for composers in town and my name came up. And he listened to my stuff and he hired me. Uh, pretty much on the spot. He offered the job. I'm like, absolutely. And at that point, that was like maybe three or four years into uh, my career. That that was the biggest thing I've worked on. Like getting connected with that company. That was a huge uh, milestone. Milestone. And um, I worked on. I'm sorry, I'm going kind of back, so it makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, I was working working on Red versus Blue, and after that, um, I kind of joined the team over there and started doing sound design on different shows and mixing pretty much all their animation series for years um, while still working on Red vs. Blue whenever the, whenever there's a new season and doing other things on the side like other games and film. So, <laughs> um, while I was working with them there constantly, um, they started talking about the show that they're developing uh, called Genlock and... Um, I uh, I got wind of it and I uh, was extremely excited about it. It sounded like perfect show to work on, futuristic kind of like electronic hybrid stuff. I'm like yes, this I got my got my name all over it. And um, they were talking about working with some pretty big people back in the day. But I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I will. I started writing demos. No one asked me to, <laughs> but I wrote like two or three demos. Yeah, I went up to the director Gray, and um, and just I'm like, hey, um, I know you didn't ask me to, but I, I'm, I'm just gonna email you these things and, and just take a listen. And he listened to it and he loved it. He loved everything. I, I essentially wrote like three themes, like the, like this little love theme that they had in there, like the action hero theme, and then um, kind of like an overall type sound, like what the show would sound like, and kind of made a, a whole track out of it. And I pretty much kind of got the job <laughs> like that. <laughs> I was a little aggressive about it, you know. Um, wrote a demo without being asked to, and that's it. <laughs> so, but Gen wow. Lock was a beast, man. It was, it was a beast. It was, it was. Um, they had a lot of big stars on it, like Michael B. Jordan was on it, and um, um, David Tennant and uh, Maisie Williams from Game of Thrones. And the way it looked like for me, it was about five or six months of production. And I, there were eight episodes, and an episode was about 25 minutes on average. And it was wall to wall music. And it was really like complex music. So, a lot of action scenes, a lot of intricate things in there. And it was all hybrid orchestral. And um, I was working about 13 to 14 hour days, six days a week. I'm sorry, seven days, <laughs> um, seven days a week for like six months. Um, I think it was, yeah, it was somewhere around there, like five to six months. It was fucking nuts. Um, I'm trying to do the math in my head. I think we started in like. Did you have a lot of energy drinks <laughs> to try? And... Um, no, I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It was like, it was somewhere around five months. Right. Um, so I was, I was doing great in the beginning. Um, and then I remember, like, halfway through the season, that was episode five, um, I experienced a, a burnout. <laughs> I didn't, I've heard of it before, but I'm like, that, that's not going to happen to me. And I didn't know what was happening exactly, because that never, that never happened to me before. I just remember coming up here in my studio and just sitting in front of the computer, watching the episode, and just, like, just, like, my, my fucking brain was empty. It's like, no, I was just fucking staring at the screen. I was just, like... Like psychologically, like emotionally and physically, just fucking broken. Like I was exhausted. I was mentally exhausted, physically, and and I, <laughs> I was done. Like I, I'm like I didn't know how. I don't know what to do. Um, 
But at that point, I, I kind of learned like an important lesson. Uh, I've mentioned this before. And um, at that point, like that was kind of like my breaking point. I'm like, I, I can't go any further, I don't think. And um, I, um, I pushed myself just a little more, you know, just like just one more baby step. And I feel like as soon as I did that, I kind of like fucking like leveled up, you know, like I, I kind of whatever it was like that extra step that I took that mental and physical kind of like, all right, just sit here really hard and kind of really, really push myself to do this, even though I, I feel like I don't have it in me. When I did that, for whatever reason, something kind of clicked in my head and it was it was all kind of it became easy after. I don't know why, like something changed in my head after that point. And I feel like um, maybe there's a valuable lesson here. Maybe maybe your limit is not what you think it is. You know, if you feel like you're at your limit, but you push just a little bit more, maybe there's more in there. Um, like right when you're about to give up, just go a little more. and And, and you do have it in you, you know. I've heard that though, that like a lot of the times in those situations, it's your mind that's your, the worst culprit. And that if you can just somehow break that barrier. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping you didn't have any experiences like that while working on Doom. No, not really. Doom was so fast paced. It wasn't, you know what it is? It's, um, I feel like it's, I feel like it's more those long projects. Like it's... It's not that Genlock was like beyond like my ability to um uh, I could do it. I could I could write the music. I knew exactly what to do. Um it's just it was just so much work. And it in it wasn't like a 2 month sprint. It was a 6 month like 5 to 6 month sprint. And I think that's maybe what what broke me, you know? Hmm. Cuz Doom was like, like very short spurts of of work. Very intense, but very short. So in a way, I guess it's easier. I'm not sure. It's like you're not really you're not really running a marathon, you know. Different Just challenges. What I, I feel guess. like. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah, but um, maybe that was the hardest part about Genlock. It's just like it doesn't it didn't end, and each episode was bigger and bigger musically, and, and there's more action and and more things to 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 think about and more things to do. Um, but I'm I'm really. I'm really grateful for that project. Like, I feel like after that, I, I could do anything. Hmm. I want to um, ask you about when you first moved to Austin, because I know yeah. you found it quite hard at first. And I think there's a lot of oh, people out there hard. that when they move to a new place, well, they don't even move to a new place because they're too scared for whatever reason. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to ask you about your experience with that and how you got through it, because I know it was pretty hard for you at first. It was, man. It was it was many years of just kind of working on just tiny, tiny projects like mobile games, apps, um, little indie games, indie film, and like ninety percent of those projects never even never even saw the day of light. All right, they just they never got off the ground. Um, so it was very it was very frustrating. So, um, and not to mention like. I barely made any money for years, like barely anything. Um, it was hard. Like I got to a point where I'm like, I maybe I need to stop. Um, because so I moved to a new city and I was pursuing a career that um, <laughs> maybe I didn't have any fucking right pursuing. Honestly, <laughs> I'm not. I never went to fucking school for this. Um, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Right, I had like a background in engineering. I did that for like eight years, and um. But I've always written music on the side and always just for fun. And for whatever reason, my shit always kind of sounded like cinematic, you know. And people always mention that to me. Like, hey, this sounds like a movie score. I'm like, okay, cool. I do like doing it. And um, I decided to kind of pursue a career in that full time. Um, but yeah, um, it was it was difficult. Um, I had to give a talk to some university f like last week and um, about just kind of my path and my career and all that. And I sat down and, and, and kind of looked back into everything and, and broke it down to like three phases. So that was like the first phase. It's maybe like the first three years of my career or so. And 
it was it was a, it was a hard phase, obviously, because it's just kind of like establishing uh, my name and getting my hands on as many projects as I could to to hone my skill and and learn all these different things I need to learn. And um, it was all tiny the, the tiniest projects you could work on. I did like mods for StarCraft, like really essentially. I I, I would just go out and if someone had something to work on, I would do it. Um, money or no money. Um, after that, I got into working with Rooster Teeth and uh, kind of bigger projects and um, just bigger films and, and bigger games. Still no triple A anything. And that was kind of phase two and that lasted for like three or four years, maybe four years. And after that, it's like the third phase, which is like the really big stuff. You know, it's like the, it's like the Genlocks and the Doom and Simulation and this other film I'm working on now. Um but you know the first phase is also very very important because I I've met a lot of people and made a lot of connections, and um even though I would say at least seventy percent of those connections like they were very useful at the time in the first two or three years because they I kept getting more small projects out of people and and kind of being involved in whatever it is that they're doing. Um, once I kind of moved away from that, um, I didn't really didn't really stay in touch with most of those guys. Um, a lot of them, honestly, I'm I'm sure they they got frustrated too. You know, it's it's a lot of just passion projects and little games, and they didn't have any success, so they they stopped. <laughs> and I was almost at the same point. But um, yeah, at that point, I was just accumulating as many like. Um, projects as I could and I was very diligent about um, making um, composer reels and updating them all the time on my website and having stuff on SoundCloud and having a, 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 a body of work. Um, and I think that's what helped me secure a job with Rooster Teeth. It's the fact that I had all these little projects, all these songs, all the tracks. And something that's really important is that when, when, when people and composers are getting into it, when they work with small developers, if they're not getting paid, or even if they're getting paid uh, very little or whatnot, just make sure to always keep the rights to all your music so you can release it on your own if you want to. And that's something I did. Um, because if they if they own your music, like most big companies do, like Rooster Teeth essentially owns all my music. I can't release any of it. Um, same with game developers as well. It's just easier for them to buy it outright. Um so with the smaller stuff, like I was able to get the majority of the tracks that I, that I wrote and kind of release them in albums over the years, um, just compilation albums, and and at least those tracks then then like die on a hard drive somewhere, you know. So at least something came out of it, and um, I believe that helped me move forward and, and get more jobs. That I had something to show for, and. And I was also like diligent about the projects that I knew if this film is like, it's not going to go anywhere. You could tell from the beginning. I, I just made sure that I have at least like one little scene to grab out of it so I could use that as in my in my reel. Because the reel is, is everything. You know, it's, it's it's your business card. It's like, hey, this is what I can do. It's super important. So um, I always made sure to, to grab things from every project I worked on in the beginning and, and have something. But now I look at my reels and they look a garbage to me. <laughs> like, like this is embarrassing. I need to delete this stuff. <laughs> well, it shows what stuff. you were at the time, I suppose. I know, I know. The but the, I, trajectory. It's true. But, you know, if someone like, if a triple A developer like looks at my reel now, they're like, what is this garbage? You know, I'm like, I always wonder that. Like, am I losing jobs because of this thing right now? Like this stuff, it's not relevant to what I can do, you know? Um, so yeah, I think I need to do something about that. <laughs> I kind of forgot about the existence of those things. Um, well, I, I, so, think, yeah. I think most people know you now for Doom anyway. So that's like the ultimate reel. I suppose. So if yeah, anyone goes so. back and looks at your reel, they're probably going to look at Doom first. I would say. Yeah, I should. Yeah, yeah, I should. I should put like like years and dates on those things or something. <laughs> yeah, just so people know. So, yeah, this possibly. is like twenty. This is like nine years ago, dude. Like. <laughs> so during that first phase, obviously there would have been, there would have been parts or moments where you would have been disheartened and the voices in your head saying, "What are you doing?" And I don't yeah. even know if there are even people in your life saying, "Dude, what are you doing?" Because no, thankfully, no. That's everyone's good. Everyone's very, everyone's very supportive. 
But there was – obviously there would have been moments that you had that though. So how did you push through that and keep going? Um, I knew that there's no other option. I didn't want to go back to the studio. Um, and the more I did this kind of – the more I did this, the more I wanted to do it, you know? Um, so I I just – there was no other option. It was this. I got to make this – I got to make this work. I, I got to make this happen. Um, completely – I was completely still I'm completely like you know like tunnel vision with this stuff I'm hyper focused on it and it's, it's everything well that's inspiring because I, I know there'd be a lot of musicians out there that probably do give up and just when they're right on the on the knife's edge of maybe having a breakthrough as well and, and it's funny you say that because um it's a story that I've said I've told it a couple of times where I um I got to meet Austin Wintory uh, composer from um, Journey and many other projects and it was like a and a he was involved with a um, it was um, that um, like the video game orchestra thing they came out they came out here to Austin and uh, it was like a meet and greet after I asked him like dude how do you how do you not give up so I'm I'm, I'm there like I've been doing this for years I'm just getting tiny projects that, that fail like what do you do and and he said he said to me that essentially you never know when things are going to click, you never know when things will fall into place. And I'm like, okay, that's good. I'm gonna go with that for a little bit. And I think it was just a few months later when I got the call from Rooster Teeth. Wow. So I think that's a very good advice that everyone needs to keep in mind. If it's something you really want, if this is what you want to do, what you want to be, and you, you really shouldn't have another option um unless of course you find yourself living under a bridge because of this decision then yeah but even then i mean i i had to just do a lot of like daytime type jobs just to keep doing this at night um to be able to support myself so if this is what you want to do you just you gotta you gotta keep going you really just know the choice just keep going that's good advice it's good it motivation for me too. I don't know. Keep, that's just keep that's going with yeah. This. That's just no. Yeah, I mean, this is what you want to do. You gotta you gotta go, and you gotta keep assessing things as they as you go. See what works, what doesn't, and adjust and keep pushing. Mm. And that's kind of what I did. I mean, I don't know. That that was just my. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Yeah, but I think that's a good philosophy to have. Totally. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Did you manage <laughs> to negotiate any royalty checks or anything with any any of your previous work? Um, no, <laughs> not really. <laughs> not yet. Not it, yet. Not yet. No, not yet. It's um, it's a weird thing, you know, because when I got into Rooster Teeth, it was a new guy, so I don't know. Um, I didn't want to rock the boat too much. Mm. You know what I mean? Because I've asked this, like, I've asked this question to a lot of composers, and yeah. some say they do get royalty checks, and some don't. Like Mick Gordon yeah. said, he didn't for Doom, and he's like. When people talk about most well-known composers, he's probably yeah. Video game composers, he's probably at the top. And then there's lesser yeah. ones that I know that have, are getting royalty payments. So it's just it depends, like because as I said before, like most of these big companies, they don't want to mess with that shit. They just they they'll just pay you more upfront and own all your shit. Essentially, it's easier for them. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I suppose. I suppose. Yeah. 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 Um. I've gotten royalties from one thing, from one show, but it was, it's nothing. <laughs> I think it you know, helps cause, though. Because you want, you want to get royalties. You guys, like, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it's not like it's obviously going to income, make you right? so you're able to live off it. But no, if no. you're in a position where it helps you, so you don't have to worry, like you're not Absolutely. living project to project, then it all yeah. Helps. But you need like you need projects like Doom. You need stuff that that's being sold in the millions. You know, oftentimes. It's the little tiny projects that 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 you get royalties on because the budget wasn't really there to begin with and you get some points on the back end or whatnot, you know? And then it's at least in my experience there really wasn't much. Um but you know what I did figure out very 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 early on is you know with the whole royalty thing is like I like uh, like passive income is huge. Um and um, I was doing things for a while, um, just kind of making sample packs. 
and selling them through different websites and different companies. And that's that's a great way to to make passive income. Right? Smart. Um yeah, I didn't the thing is <laughs> I was always busy with like big composing stuff. Like I I didn't have the time to sit in 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 uh spend like a year just making libraries like sound libraries. If I would, I would probably be able to make decent money a month from just, just passive income, you know. But that is a very good way to do it. And when I just started, um, I wrote all this music and I, I wrote stuff that even when, obviously, when I didn't have projects in the beginning, I just kept writing things. And I did a lot of like, kind of like, I studied other composers and other tracks that I liked and try to understand why they sound the way they do and, and um, a lot of kind of reverse engineering type stuff. And I didn't have anything to do with that music, and I would put it on websites like Audio Jungle, and um, where I would make like twenty dollars a month. <laughs> you know, it's like it's stupid, but it's something. Um, if you have it on enough things, like it, it could, it, it could, it could pile up. You know, um, so if you put, I feel like if you put some serious time into developing some sort of like uh you could do like a music pack like like mobile game pack or um or just like standalone sounds like one shots type thing drums guitar synths whatever um you can put it on like on splice or 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 bigger companies too and and um not bigger but splice is pretty big but other other big companies um um you if if you devote some time to to do this and and you could you could make thousands of dollars a month honestly and it's a matter of like um having a large quantity of of products that that you sell each month so the more you have the more money you'll make you could probably capitalize on that now because of your name because you have a well known name now so I, i'm yeah. sure people would probably just buy it just because of your name yeah i'm kind of working on something actually <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> <laughs> Just gotta find the time to finish it. <laughs> yeah, that's always always the thing, right? Time is the enemy. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so those those are, those are ways that kind of bypassing the whole like working for big companies that don't want to pay your royalties. There's other ways to make passive income and in, um, that that resembles royalties from soundtracks. You know, mm. it's just yeah, it's extra work because. The nice thing about royalties from stuff that you're in is that it's written already and you can make extra money off of it. But for like sound packs, you have to make a new product, obviously, mm. um, to sell. Yeah. Cool. Well, hey, um, I'm going to wrap up there. I know it's late there, oh, yeah? so um, I don't um, want to keep yeah, you too I'm good. long. But um, <laughs> thank you so much for taking time out. As I said, it's obviously been a long time for us to get, for us to get here, but I uh, very much appreciate it. A year, I think, to the date, as you said. So um, it's coming, Pretty much, coming yeah. full circle in a way. <laughs> right? It's crazy. <laughs> it's been a year already, man. It's yeah. fucking nuts. <laughs> so where can everyone follow you? YouTube, Twitter, Instagram? Yeah, yeah it's essentially like David Levy music everywhere. <laughs> Just yeah. It's the same uh, handle on, on like uh, Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah, man. Well, that David, was fun, man. Thanks yeah, for man. having me. Yeah, likewise. I've learned a lot and actually like this has really much motivated me um, to keep going as well because, you know, you always have those days where you're like, uh, you know. Yeah, and yeah. No, voices no, in no, your no. head as well. So, no, thanks I so know, much. but you, you got to look at the big picture and look at what you've done and look at where you want to be. Connect the dots. A lot of times, a lot of times there are no dots to connect. You just kind of fucking walk in the dark. You know what I mean? You make the dots. I'm, yeah, I fucking I did that for years. <laughs> It's scary, but again, man, I mean, if it's something you're passionate about, then you, you shouldn't, you really shouldn't stop because you're going to find yourself regretting it down the road, I think. Yeah. I mean, or not, unless you got something better, <laughs> but well, let's something, say that you don't. Yeah. Well, something better could always be on the horizon. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, that is the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe, support the brother David and all his future endeavors <laughs> uh yeah and take care